Okay. Okay, I'm audible, right? Clear. The recording is started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to BC 201 on Christian History and Missions. Today, um, we're going to continue from the place where we stopped last week. We're going to study again in detail on the Constantine. Before we could begin with our session, we can start with a word of prayer. Can I request Zeli, if possible? Can you pray? Yes, sure, Pastor. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before our throne of grace, Lord, as we begin our class, Lord. Holy Spirit, you empower our Pastor Diana, Lord God. And also, Lord, give her the wisdom, the grace to teach your word of God, Lord. And help each one of us so that our hearts are receptive, Lord. And you bless each one of us, Lord. We commit our session into Him to Lordship. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we're on page 37 on our notes. Okay, we're going to study on Constantine the Great. Uh, who lived in AD 312, and these dates are approximate. Yeah. So we see that <coughs> after Constantine's father's death, Constantine continued to build a reputation as a man who was capable of, you know, taking Take, uh, taking the whole empire into an action and he he, he, f he faced many battles and he attacked many uh, a kingdom around him and he attacked the Franks and he won many battles. So we see that uh, a certain act of his was without mercy where he killed two Frankish kings by throwing them to a beast in the amphitheater that they had those days. And later we see, at the same time, he was also a compassionate king, uh, uh, emperor, where he restored the church property that had earlier been confiscated by the other emperors. So slowly, what Constantine did was, he started to gain the respect of the army where he demonstrated uh, military power among the men and um, where people could trust him. He slowly started gaining the trust among the people. So with that little support, he enters into a city to go against the Maxentius who left Rome. So now this Emperor Maxentius comes back to meet Constantine on a final crucial battle. And this battle is called as Milvian Battle of Milvian Bridge, which took place approximately in 312 AD. So on the day before the battle could begin, it's reported that Constantine saw a vision in the sky. Okay, let me... Uh, I have made a presentation. I thought I'll share it with you all. Just give me a minute. So these pictures are what was available on the internet more closely. So I just took them for us to keep our class interesting. Yeah, that's Constantine the Great. Can we all see it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we all can see. Okay. And this was the vision it looked like. So we're not too sure exactly it was across that way and the words appeared that way. <coughs> Sorry. So what happened was, but here we see, uh, the scholars say, the historians say that Constantine had a vision. He saw a vision on the sky where he saw the cross of light just above the sun and under it the, there was an inscription um i have not put the inscription there just give me a minute i'll just insert the inscription so we all know what the inscription was 
you all can see that okay so under the cross there was an inscription which was written as in hoc signo venus which means which means in this sign you conquer in this sign conquer this is the meaning of that word that appeared on the sky so that night the same night he also had a dream he received the explanation of the sign that he saw in the sky where uh, it says that jesus christ appeared before him telling him to carry the sign of the cross into the battle so the following day he carried the banners <coughs> the banners were replaced with this cross if you see um let me put the other slide can you all see uh, yeah, here we see uh, the uh, the banners that they carried in their hand also carried the sign that he saw on the sky, which had a cross and inscription of that writing. So constantly, what happened following that? Uh, th they won the battle. Constantine easily defeated this emperor Max. Maxtanius who fled he fled back to Rome and almost when he was reaching the city this Maxtanius emperor fell into the river and he was drowned and later they found his body on the seashore the next morning so the historians say that Constantine's conversion to Christianity was the victory that he got from this battle so this became a turning point for him in the history so Constantine immediately assumed uh, that complete control of the West he took control of the West and he he nominated himself as the new Augustus in the West so he marched into the room with this and the first thing that he did was he issued the edict of milan that is a tolerance of all religion which was later also accepted by the other emperors now having this power in his hand he did something good like uh, he, he restored the land to the christians they were uh, uh, and he changed all the pagan uh, temple into the worship place for christians so he, he showed much favor to the christians because uh, jesus helped him to won the battle so here you see uh, there was a conversion of him conversion to christianity though he is from a pagan culture but then after this very incident he changed himself so what happened uh, there was with that we see there was a first council of Nicaea so after uh, uh, the, there was a major challenge that took place in AD let me see what's the date in our notes council of Nicaea 325 AD, correct. They're on page 38, Council of Nicaea. So, what happened here is in AD 325, a presbyter in Alexandria, Arius had been teaching that at some point God has created Christ. So, because of this teaching, there was a riot in that place riot broke in several cities and we see constantine now because he's favoring the christians he brings the bishops together at the city of nice to resolve this issue so what happened at the council of nice resulted in the christian doctrine which is known as the trinity so uh, uh so the council voted to claim that Christ was the identical essence of God present at Christ, uh, creation and he manifested on earth in Jesus of 
Nazareth, as Jesus of Nazareth. And um, we also see uh, the in this council, they said that Christ returned. And now this Christian emperor stands in for Christ. So they carry a lot of identical power of God on earth and the way he rules. So what happened here is in this council, <coughs> there was a concept of a creed from a, a Latin word credo. That means I believe was introduced. So so that all the Christians would believe the details of Jesus, like how he was born. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, who was born of a virgin. You know, the Nicene Creed that is there, the formula that we have right now. Right now it is in the Catholic Church. So this creed, the Nicene Creed, was formed by the council there so that everyone believes um, on the birth of Jesus, on the virgin birth of Jesus, and he was the incarnated by God, um, he was sent by God, he's the only son. You know, all these details have been given in that creed. Let me read that creed to you. Just give me a minute. Yeah. So it says, I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one God, one Lord Jesus Christ, who was the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, light from light to God and true God. <coughs> begotten not made one has been with the father through him all things were made so they come up with this okay it is a very long creed that they wrote y'all can read in detail which is available yeah so in the second century the writing of this church fathers produced what eventually became the Christians dogma so many of them came up with the same kind of uh, idea and uh, Constantine's letter and speeches on this creed became more evident to the churches and they all started following this creed we also see as Emperor Constantine continued the standard practice as I said like uh, building monuments and big basilicas around the place where he lived in the Rome. So the shapes helped uh, form the standard of the churches uh, where um, in Rome we see Constantine build the first basilicas which is still standing strong that is St. Peter's and St. John in Latrain and his new, this new imperial city which was trying to establish as Constantinople became very famous for its imperial architecture. Well, in 325 AD, Constantine's mother, Helena, she went on a pilgrimage trip to Israel. And there, she claims to have discovered the sites uh, that associated with Jesus, the birth of Jesus, um, including the cross, the true cross. And here we see Constantine then constructed the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem through the help of his mom. And we also see uh, there was another church that he built as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, that is housing the tomb of Jesus in Jerusalem. So Constantine started to build many churches uh, uh, across the Rome, across the Constantinople. And in his will, and he he wished to be buried uh, uh, in one of the plays, saying that he was the 13th apostle. After the 12 apostles, he wants to be the 13th apostle. And um, we, we're not too sure was he buried in the same way that he wished. Uh, but then the church uh, grew during his time. It grew and it flourished and it had some kind of political power. So Constantine the Great 
maintained his role as a military commander. Well, in AD 337, we see that Constantine fell ill and he died. So approximately, he ruled for about 31 years and he was buried at the Church of the Holy Apostles in Constantinople, living his empire in the hands of his three sons. So what are the names of the three sons? First son was named as Constantine II. Second son was Constantinus after his father, second. And the third was Constans. So what happened eventually was the second son, Constantius II, defeated his two brothers and he started to rule the entire empire on himself. Okay, so let's go to the presentation. So this was the Battle of the Milvian Bridge that took place, which was very famous. And this was one of the Arch of Constantine, which he constructed before he could become a Christian. And yes, this was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was built under the leadership of his mom, Helena, at Jerusalem. Okay, with that, we will move on to the next person. <coughs> UCBS, Bishop of Caesarea. He is also known as the father of church history. So, unlike the ancient histories, he preserved so well the records of UCBS where his own life has mostly been lost. The biographies that was been written about him has been lost. But then his parents, um, to see about his personal background, um, his early life about his parents or about his early life is not known and very little about his youth has been recorded. So UCBS was almost um, or they're not too sure about his birthplace because the information about his early childhood days have been lost. But then some scholars say that he was born in Palestine around 260 AD and uh, and spent the greater part of his life in that place. So as a young man, Eusebius assisted and studied under a well-known Christian teacher, Pamphilius. And Pamphilius was the bishop of Caesarea who later became Eusebius' closest friend. As they had a good fellowship, grew together, they became they developed a good friendship with each other. And we see Eusebius was baptized at Caesarea and he served as a presbyter or an elder under the leadership of Pamphilius. So Eusebius was also acquainted with the presbyter Dorotheus in Antioch and probably would have received an instruction from him as well. But we see Eusebius followed Pamphilius much more closely than any other leader. So we see that um, he was uh, later days when we see how he led his life or uh, the, uh, the things that he thought was more closely to the teaching of Pamphilius. So as a bishop of Caesarea, Pamphilius was the foremost Bible scholar and he was a teacher of his generation. And he had certain devoted disciples uh, uh, who was ministered and by him. So, <coughs> and Pamphilius had a big personal library which was devoted to the Christian community in Caesarea. And Pamphilius also built uh, uh, he, he made this library uh, to, uh, to have the greatest Christian collection of books in the ancient world. So many people were attracted to this library and it was also known to be the greatest Christian, Christian library at Caesarea. And 
yeah and it was uh, primarily known as a learning center for the roman christians those days and during his time there was also a great persecution so in ad 303 the roman emperor diocletian began a persecution of christians in the roman empire so what happened during this time UCBS was an eyewitness, so he has been documenting the terrible persecution that has been taking place during his season. So here, UCBS writes saying that, with our own eyes, the houses of prayer been thrown down to the very foundation. And he says, the divine and the sacred scriptures committed to the flames in the marketplace and the shepherds of the churches basely hidden here and they were captured and mocked by their enemies towards the end of this great persecution famphilius who was a great teacher and a scholar was thrown in the prison and finally he was martyred by AD 310. So during this period, we see UCBS traveled to Egypt. I can't say he was traveled, but he tried to escape from this persecution. He went to Egypt where he was imprisoned there for a short time. But even during that imprisonment, somehow he managed to escape from the prison. And shortly after the end of this great persecution, around the time of Constantine's conversion, it was in the same period, we see when the Edict of Milan was released, UCBS was elected as a bishop of Caesarea after the death of his leader. Pamphilius. So we, he served for many years until his death. So Eusebius continued with his work of recording the church history. He was a good writer and a scholar because he was trained under the leadership of Pamphilius. So he knew the importance of recording the things and keeping it safe. So although not counted among the Although UCBS was not counted among the most uh, great or gifted theologians in history, but he was known for being trained under a well-known educated scholar, Pamphilius. And he was capable of writing and keeping a record of the church history for his generation. So um, with that, the scholars later drew the abundant resources from UCBS, which was recorded about the church history and the events and the incidents that took place during his time. And he had preserved it in the church library of Pamphilius. So with that, we see UCBS did a great contribution to the church history. And And yes, he was also part of the Council of Nicaea. And originally, this was written in Greek, and later it was translated in Latin, Aram uh, Aramic, and uh, Syriac. These are the languages that were spoken and read those days. Well, about UCBS, we see that UCBS has written uh, uh, 40 written works during uh, during his time which had the topics of theology exegesis apologetics gospel criticism biblical geography chronology uh, then the matra matra law or is it matrology i'm sorry if i've not pronounced it correctly so his writings involved all these and UCPS favorite theme was focused on the stories of the early Christian martyrs as seen in the Palestine martyr so which covered the persecution of the fourth century of Christians in the East and we also see UCPS stayed active in the church councils until his death so he raised to be a good and effective leader who grew to uh, be the bishop of Caesarea and he was active in almost all 
church council he was present and he has recorded everything that each council had decided with that we will move on to the canon let me check we are on page 39 canon of the new testament was confirmed in ad 367 <coughs> Yeah, so what happened, the term ca canon was used with a reference to the Bible means of collection of books, which are received divinely inspired through the authoritative for faith and life. So we see that uh, this canon of the New Testament was one of the most important developments in the thought and practices of the early church. Though the history is silent as to how, when, and by whom it was brought about, but it is possible to know that uh, some of the leaders were influenced at that time and have contributed to the emergence of the New Testament canon. So they did not create the Christian scriptures, but they only confirmed what was already there so they just uh, recognized and accepted and they put these scriptures together so at first a local church would have only had few apostolic letters for example like one or two gospels and during the course of the second century is where the most churches came to possess and acknowledge a canon which included uh, right now what we have the first four gospels of matthew mark luke and john they put together along with the book of acts and then they considered the 13 letters of saint paul or apostle paul and then they also included first peter and first john and later there were seven books that still lacked in the recognition that was hebrew james second peter second and third john jude and revelation so um, these letters was added much later much later during the time of Athanius, who was the first to name them. And exactly only during this time, that is in AD 367, where the New Testament of all 27 books were put together and combined in the canonical point two, that is in the second canon meeting, where the New Testament, what we have was brought together. But Still, there were certain other groups like the Syrian Orthodox and Presbyterian. Those people took time to accept the, the addition of the new books and they want to retain themselves of what they had considered as scriptures during their time. So with that, we will move on to the next person. And an emperor. Then we also see the Latin Vulgate Bible was co uh, composed by Jerome in AD 384. Give me a minute, please. Yeah, 384. So what happened? The Vulgate in the 4th century, it is a Latin translation of the Bible produced primarily by Mr. Jerome or St. Jerome. or uh, He was one of the priests those days. So working from the ancient Greek manuscript, the original Hebrew or the Aramic text that was there. So Jerome aimed to create a translation that the church could uh, preserve it or the church could read these original scriptures in their language. So Jerome completed his work in 405 AD, but he continued to revise on the Latin Vulgate for years, for centuries. And the Latin speaking church relied more on this 
translation, especially for scholars who studied the scriptures in the Latin language. So more than 1,000 years after it was finished. So the Vulgate became the official Latin Bible of the Catholic Church, which it remained until 1979. Then we see the most people were aware of the King James Version, which was lasting impact in the English language. We also see how the Western literature, art and culture that took place during this season. But the Latin Vulgate was the most popular Bible translation for more than a millennia, even before the King James Version was existed. So Jerome played a very vital role in translating this uh, uh, Septuagint version or the Greek version of Bible into the Latin. And it was named as uh, the Vulgate Bible, composed by Jerome and was translated directly from the Hebrew. So with that, we will move on to the next person in um, Augustine was also one of the father. Uh, he lived in AD 386. He's also known as Augustine of Hippo. He was born in 354 AD. Again, these dates are approximate, so I'm not too keen on giving out the dates because each article or each scholar give a different dates, okay? But Let's look into his life, which which he lived and how he impacted the church. So here we see that Augustine was born in Tagaste, that a place in North Africa in the Roman provinces of Numidia. Most likely, his family of family were from a Berber lineage, where his father Patrick was a pagan, and his mother. Monica was a devoted Christian. So this was a very common practice those days in the Roman Empire because <coughs> during the rule of Constantine, many people from the pagan culture were converted to Christianity. So some of them accepted the religion and practiced Christianity and some of them remained in the pagan culture. So we do not know much about his father, Patrick, but yes, about his mother, Monica, who was very ambitious in following the Christian tradition, uh, Christian religion. And she also was very keen in bringing up a son into the right, uh, 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 into Christianity. So we see that, um, We see that uh, from his childhood that Augustine had an excellent education. Uh, he was a very good orator and he was educated in a very good school of philosophy and he pursued his studies well. But at a very younger age, when he was 15 years old, he got into a relationship with a woman. So it was too early for him to get into such kind of relationship but then he was he was um, he went astray uh, that's what his mom says that um, Augustine went astray at a very young age for which his mom had to pray a lot seeking God for a transformation of his son but then he wanted to get married to this lady and then apparently they also had son together in this relationship and he named the child as adieu adieu datis that means gift of god but on a, he who died at a young age the child died at a young age and with this dissolution in the circle augustine's mom takes him and moves into a different place so that hoping that he would change his lifestyle. So they moved to a mill into a place in Italy where he won the position of a professor. So Monica began uh, negotiating with Augustine to get him married and settle in his life. But then while, he, while his mom was 
trying to look out for a girl he again got into a relationship with another woman and he later says that in one of his confessions that he has written he says that he had become a slave to lust and and later with the influence of his mom and the prayer of others he writes that he started to pray lord lord give me chastity and a continence but not just yet so he started praying about his lifestyle because he was not too keen or too happy in that uh, adulterous or in the lifestyle that he was living so we see slowly how augustine was converted to christianity or how he was transformed to receive uh, jesus as the lord and savior or how he changed his lifestyle so we see that later part in the confessions uh, we see that uh, in this new place He, he was in touch with the bishop of Milan, of Aurelius Ambrose, who was a prominent, famous theologian. So Augustine was very intellectually interested. So he was in touch with this bishop Ambrose, and he constantly attending the sermon of him. And later, we see these teachings impacted his life, which transformed his life so after the sermon uh, one day he was sitting on a bench outside waiting for his mother and one day he heard that uh, he thought a child was playing a sing-song game take up and read take up and read but when he did not see anyone around him then he realized that it was a supernatural call of god over him in that church and then he found a scripture in the new testament when he opened the bible um, he turned to paul's letter to romans chapter 1 verse 17 which read as for in it the righteousness of god is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith by now as he was influenced by this bishop ambrose and he started to attend the church listen to the sermon the word started changing his life the word started transforming his life because any which ways uh, where he was not happy with this adulterous lifestyle that he was living in and he wants to have a change and he was been constantly advised by his mom about God and all these things came together at a time where he heard the supernatural call coming to him and where he he took the scripture the scripture which say stated that the just shall live by faith impacted him and here we see Monica was delighted of this changed nature of Augustine and slowly Augustine tend to become a perfectionist and he started following the Christian religion. And he uh, and later we see that he was going to become a celibate, that is uh, canceling all the marriage negotiation that his mom was trying to get. And he said, I'm going to live a life of celibacy just like these monks and I want to get into this. So he joined the monastery and he started reading the word of God so with uh, yeah and as he was already a very intelligent person and he was a good orator uh, he, after joining the uh, 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 monastery he grew he grew he started studying and uh, you know there will be certain levels for them to come uh, to study and become an elected deacon then the elder deacon and then the father and then later augustine we see the history says that he was elected as a bishop of hippo uh, and he built his own monastery and he became a very renowned 
trained teacher, preacher, and he started writing his own sermon. So he often was uh, presented in the public debates and then big town hall meetings where he continuously addressed many heresies that was uh, coming up those days. And we also see God giving him a, a greater wisdom through which he could uh, uh, he could minister to people in his time but <clears throat> but one thing no matter how old he was growing but he said uh, he says that there is a problem that he struggled with himself uh, which uh, you know he had to face many friends and people uh, in his ministry and yes he said that uh, you know though he know lust is bad and he wants to overcome it but this had still effect on him through his thoughts and his mind. So here he quotes uh, Paul's scripture on Romans chapter 7, verse 21 to 25, where he says, Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For even in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, which, which is... Um, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. So what a wretched man I am. Uh, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what is Augustine trying to say or what did Apostle Paul try to say is, though they know it is wrong, but because they are in the human nature, uh, there is always a room for temptation. So no matter how perfectionist Augustine grew in his life, though he practiced practiced uh, celibacy but there was certain kind of temptation though he didn't want to give in he thought okay that has no power over him but then at even at a very later at a very old age maybe approximately he was 77 year old or between those uh, older age also he says that this temptation had a tempt over him so he says that you know no matter how a perfect we may think we may be or how old we may be or how experienced we could be in certain area but there is always a room for temptation but praise be to lord jesus christ it's only through him that he delivers us from such temptations and he strengthens us in our weaknesses he says and also we see a very important story that stands out even now is uh, one day when uh, Saint Hagas, I mean, Augustine, Father Augustine, or the Bishop of Hippo, uh, used to face a lot of persecution, a lot of struggles, or you know the heresies that he had to stand and debate and uh, handle them. So what happened? He took a break from his work and he just walked along the beach side one day pondering upon God's wisdom or trying to understand the nature of God on how to debate and how to give a clear speech or sermon to people. As he was pondering on that and he was walking, um, just give me a minute. Okay. As he was pondering on that and he was uh, walking on the beach side, it was in this moment that he found a little boy little boy um, caught Augustine's attention. So what was this child doing? This child was determined to clear up something and he was running back and forth. That is between the sea and a tiny hole that this child has made on the shore. So Augustine was looking at this boy's action, he went towards him and asked son what are you doing there and the boy replied by telling him that I'm trying to empty move the water he's using a small pink shell he, sa he said that uh, you know I'm trying to em move the water from uh, from you know, I'm trying to fit that great big ocean into this tiny hole through this pink shell. 
so he he he, he said this by pointing out to the uh, hole that he has made in the uh, sand so augustine smiled at this little child's innocence and he said he knelt down next to the boy and he said how can you how can you empty the whole ocean and try to fit it into this tiny hole and he, he, he just simply he, he just asked this little child you could never fit this great ocean into this tiny hole but the child didn't flinch but he responded quickly to him and he said you could never possibly understand the holy trinity nor the wisdom of god and then in a flash of a second this boy disappeared so over the centuries we see many scholars or many historians debate on this child would it be a an angel or would this child be a christ himself to bring an understanding uh, or a revelation to augustine so when we ponder on this uh, of on what the child said yes it's a life's big question isn't it we can never understand these mysteries all at once in our tiny little mind that we have god's wisdom is as big as the ocean and how can a man uh, with his little brain like that small hole try to capture the ocean try to capture god's wisdom no but if we open our mind to god yes he will reveal himself to us bit by bit or drop by drop just like what the child did step by step and if you look at the story that has been revealed here to augustine can the child fit a tiny bit of salt water into that sandy hole before it sank away yes the same way god often imparts himself to us bit by bit drop by drop so three so through these stories uh, we see that uh, you know augustine book also concludes uh, the work most of such revelations that he received during his time he has written in confessions it's called as the confessions and the city of god which worked on d trinate for over 30 years and yeah he has not ever finished it because he cannot finish it there's so much of revelation that he received during his time that he has documented here and yes this has uh, kept our mind also open to keep ourselves open not to understand god completely but allow god to reveal himself part by part little by little in our own walk in our own relationship with god yes so these are the church fathers who i have impacted um who have uh, you know uh, defended the gospel defended the faith uh, despite their bad lifestyle but god chose them god uh, gave them a chance to transform their life we also see how powerful the scripture could be the one rema word of romans 117 of saying the just shall live by faith transformed a man um, who was addicted into adultery we see how god could transform him and use him greatly and raise him into a higher position who became the bishop of hippo if god could do that through augustine i'm sure god could through uh, do that to any of us so yes just that we need to be available we need to keep ourselves equipped we need to dedicate our life uh, to god and have that kind of fellowship of seeking him more depending on him so with that we will end this session and we will continue we will go on in the next class we will study on the middle age or the dark age of the early reformers okay with that we will end this session with a word of prayer yeah
that's Augustine and his mum's picture. Sorry, I didn't move the slide. Yeah. Dear God, thank you for this time. Thank you that you give us the session week after week. We pray that um, you will keep the session interesting. You will help us to reveal the church fathers, the life, how they lived, how the Spirit of the Lord moved through different seasons. Lord, I pray that you are the God who is also moving in and through us. Thank you, Lord. We ask this in most precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.